humor, haunts, and homicide. Like that little like spray at the end. <laughs> shh. I love that. Maybe should I should I do it to your lips, like my finger in front? Like, shh. How dare you? <laughs> I just felt like the the right yeah. moment, you know, um, to shush you. I'm sorry about oh, that. Wow, unbelievable. Please forgive. Yeah. Wow. So hey, everybody. <laughs> Hi, I'm Renee. I'm Josh, and, and we're at Humor Haunts and Homicide, we are. We episode are. six, season two, coming at you. Wow, that's like. 16 episodes total. Spotify told me 18, but I think that's including our guest episodes. Probably. But now we're at 19 with oh. this one. Oh. So, isn't that cool? We're almost, yeah. next one will be 20. Oh, we're like a We're 20, growing. We're, we're a, almost 21. We're almost like We can almost podcast game. drink. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we've already broken that. We might have a DUI. We've oh, had a, a drunk episode. We did. Wow, we were underage. We were underage. Mm. Shit. What are we going to do about that? Unbelievable. You know what we're going to do? We're going to give you some of us and a little bit of the banter of what is going on in our lives. How's that sound? Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. you are all, <laughs> you, are, <laughs> you, you are all going to be really shocked to hear yeah. that I'm watching a lot of Taylor Swift and still listening oh to a God. lot of Taylor Swift. You I like know, Taylor is, Swift? I know, right? Oh my gosh. Um, so this week she was in Spain during the middle of the week. So I got to watch like a Wednesday and a Thursday like while I was at work. Okay. So that was exciting. And then um, today and like very soon she's going to be in France. She wow. is in France, and she'll be doing a concert. And, and then tomorrow also, I'm really excited. Can I give you a fun, sad story about Spain and I? Sure. So I had actually won a trip my first year as a jewelry manager. I used to sell jewelry, and I used to manage a jewelry mm-hmm. store. And I won a Christmas contest. I got to go to Italy, Spain, and France on a Mediterranean cruise. My ex last minute decided that he didn't want to go because we weren't in a good place, so he decided to turn down a free trip of a lifetime. So I went around the world alone. I got so drunk with one of my friend's husbands after the night of Italy <laughs> that I completely missed Spain the entire day. I was sleeping for 15 hours. Um, I was up drinking until like 6 a.m. with one of my friends on the boat that happened to also win. So it was her and her husband, and she went to bed early. And he and I stayed up <laughs> drinking at the bar all night uh, until like 6 a.m. I think I remember you telling me this story. I did. Um, but I didn't know the spain, like the, the yeah. sad part of the story. Yeah, they thought I was dead. They were literally about to go find some people to like open the door and find out if I was okay because when I woke up, there was um, like 10 different voicemails on my hotel door. Oh, <laughs> or the room door, I guess right. I should say. And uh, I went down there like, yeah, dude, Spain was the best out of, out of everything so far. Like, it was amazing. You missed it. I was looking at bull riding. We went and had coffee and espresso. Um, you, we went to Madrid and I was like, oh great, this is oh, awesome. Well, so I missed sad. that. That's sad. But France was amazing. Italy was amazing. So I can't say I had a bad time. No, of course not. I've been to none of the above. Yeah. So that's jealousy. Well, add it to yeah. your list of places we're <laughs> yeah. going to take well, you. Well, I mean, can we like real quick get to France for, by tomorrow so that yeah. I can see Taylor Swift? We or... can try. Is she going to France? Well, she's there today. Oh. And tomorrow. So no, I don't oh. think that's a possibility. Oh. Oh, like passports, that's probably tricky. Well, and money, you know, you need need, need that. (laughs) That's kind of expensive to go there. Yeah. I mean, I am still, I I may have talked about this before. Um, If I have, I apologize if you've heard this, but um, I am going to be driving down with my mom to Miami in October to tailgate for the three nights of the Taylor Swift. And we're hoping that like the, somehow the stars align and maybe we'll be able to score tickets last minute. Um, So, you know, you never know. I hope for you that that happens. Yeah. I mean, I, I just love going to concerts. And I mean, even if like we're just like partying in the parking lot with, with yeah. a bunch of Swifties, that'll be a good time. But you know what we don't have to do when we go to our Missy Elliott, Sierra, and Buster Bro, rides? That's coming up in like next month. Yeah. We're going to see them. Um, wow. So it I've, was... been a, I've been a fan for... I mean, God, forever. I mean, we're old, so <laughs> we this, are, is, this yeah. is our girl. Mm-hmm. Missy is our Missy, girl. Missy, Sierra, Sierra's our girl, and then of course Busta Rhymes. Busta Rhymes. I've seen him in concert before, and Ugh. it was f- fucking fantastic. So I can't wait to see him again. One of a kind. Yeah. If not one of the best, 
in my opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you agree sure. because I would break your neck. Come on. <laughs> you, know, you like that? You like that? Uh, but yeah, uh, so we're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> we have another concert also that we're going to together. We are. In November. And that is pink. I can't fucking wait. I, dude, it's, we have floor seats. Oh, uh, floor seats. We have floor seats for that. You know, funny, fun, funny, fun fact for our listeners. Um, we're going to both concerts together. However, by like some weird mishappenings, we're not sitting together for either concert. But we were still somehow miraculously able to get seats really very close. close together. Very, very close. So like for the um, Missy Elliott concert, I'm like maybe two or three rows and then like four seats behind, which isn't, which is like essentially the same, you know, like right there. And then for pink, I'm actually on the other end of the floor, but they have like this cool dance floor area that you can kind of, everybody on the floor can go to. So we're just, we're planning on converging there for, you know, a majority of the show. Yeah. And I would say we really started this concert journey back last year when we went to Beyonce. I don't know. So that kind of sparked this thing with me with concerts. I'm like, you know, I've always wanted to go to a lot of them. It was always my mission to see all these artists that I've wanted to see, but never did or told myself, why didn't I go when I should have? I could have seen all Lady Gaga so many times in Michigan when I lived there. I could have saw Britney Spears. I mean, there's so many regrets there, but uh, I'm like, wow, I can move forward and just yeah. go now to everything I want to do. I've seen a lot of live shows. It's kind of... I mean, it's been a, a while, but um, I used to go to a lot, a lot. Um, I, it's just... I, I love I love going to concerts. I haven't been to a whole lot. Let's see. I've been to NSYNC. was my very first concert. Uh, I think that was my dad's test to see if I was gay. It was my Christmas gift. Mm. And he took me, just him and I. It was cute. It was a really good time. I've seen NSYNC three times. Oh, good girl. That's awesome. I know, but you know, they're like... Your favorite. I mean, God, I was going to, I wasn't, maybe still will marry Justin Timberlake someday. No, 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 I, lo- I love Jessica Peel. That's mean. I, I, I would never break up a marriage, but, um, but you know, like I lo- love, love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you do love him. Mm-hmm. Alexa Timby. Uh, you do love him. Yeah. Oh, yes. We did, so we did talk about that. <laughs> we did our talk screen, about our screen names. Your screen AOL, name. AIM. I was Circus Freak Josh, for those of you that didn't get that in one of our, <laughs> one of our episodes. And uh, you were... Alexa Timby. Alexa Timby. And this was well before, like, the Amazon... Oh! Can you say that again? <laughs> Alexa, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she does that, because, you know, that's... We're my, in the haunted room, and my, she... It's my alter... Well, it's, we did say her name. It's oh, my alter ego. We did. Ego. You're right. We did. Yeah. Sorry. Um, one last thing about concerts, though. You recently went to one. I did. I just got done seeing NF. It was two weeks ago. And, oh my gosh, it was a good time. I loved the videos. Yes. I watched your little live. I did you post did some them. Lives. I did some lives. I did post them on some socials. I believe I even accidentally posted it on our podcast page oh, and then did realized you? it. Oh. And yes, I was kind of mad about that because I did the whole concert in like a TikTok snips, like every song in the beginning of them. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that after it posted that I posted it to the Humor Haunts and Homicide page. Of course, it's great, but it wasn't relevant. So I removed it, saved it, added it to my personal TikTok. Because that was a little more relevant. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know? Well, you know. But uh, yeah, I want all my people to see my concert. Woo! Uh, I loved your singing in the background. That yeah, was fun. yeah, that was, that was, fun I, that was another reason I took it down. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's why my Beyonce videos have never been posted. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but it was a good time. He did a really good job. I've never been to just like a rap concert before. I've always went to a performance and sync dancing or you know just people that in general performed yeah. but on stage that way. But it was good. I mean, the vibe was good. The hype was good. We had decent seats even for nosebleeds. Um, we were in the very front of the nosebleed section. Yeah. So we got a good view and they had the screens going. So it was a good time. Yeah, really, I mean, if they if they have screens especially, there's really not a bad seat in the place. I wasn't happy you know, with Beyonce, like, though. Well, I, that's why. Because they didn't have the screen. They did she, not. She didn't have the screens going the way that... No, we believe and, and we been, believed going know? into it, and this is what happened. So we got nosebleed seats initially, yeah, because it was a good price, and we thought, you know, they always have screens on there for concerts for people that can't get a good visual. The, the, the Taylor Swift concert did correct. Like I, I, like I had known that. I, I believe prior to you buying the tickets, I had known that. Yes, which so is yes. why we did that, right? Because we bought the tickets together as a group. So we were just like, you know what? That's fine. We'll sit. We'll save the money. Right. Sit higher. But they have these big screens. I mean, Raymond James has yes. these humongous screens. We'll, we'll be fine. And mm. they were not there. We were not fine. No. We had a terrible view. Mm. We 
were in the back of the top nosebleeds and we thought as soon as the concert was going we're like okay cool the screens were going pre-concert we got to see some announcements they're they're working order no problem and then she started playing and then about halfway through the concert we're like where the fuck are these screens yeah and i guess it's because of the way that her the way that the visuals for there could have been screens i, I agree the, i, I mean the I, top I completely section, agree there could have been screens in that fucking top i absolutely agree it's just yeah. Hmm. So that is we love her. We She's love our queen. Her. We love her, but that definitely was That a, was not a cool. Miss. That was a miss. Not cool for your people that can't afford your thousand dollar tickets. I mean, like literally. Shit. Wow. From the beehive. <laughs> it's all right. Um what else is going on with us? Oh, that's right. We did this thing called Book a Trip for you and Dylan's birthday. We did because we're we have July birthdays. And for those of you that don't know, Dylan is my husband, and Renee and Dylan share a birthday a couple weeks apart from each other. Yeah. In July, and I wanted to do something that was cool and something that Renee had not done before and something relevant to the podcast. We kind of all agreed that we're taking another trip back to Savannah, yeah. Georgia. Excited. Yeah, you are, bitch. I You're about cannot to be. wait. And we um we spent probably an hour picking out an an Airbnb. Yeah. To because at first we were gonna stay in like another haunt, like one of the haunted hotels, but we just couldn't find anything that you know like for the exact time and that just met what we needed. It made sense. To... Um, because there was one where the only thing they had were like rooms with king beds. Yeah. Which would have forced me to you know snuggle. In the middle of you and Dylan. Which is, I mean, if you like a gay sandwich, that's that's fine. But uh, I prefer, like, I'm one of those people that, God love my husband, but I need some space. I need my own blanket. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get hot when I'm sleeping and I move. So I, and I flail. I don't want to hurt somebody. So I like my thing. Right. My, my side of the bed. So we ended up landing on an Airbnb. It's like right in downtown. It's cute. There's, it's right by all the it's haunted like a, shit. Yeah, and it's a, like a studio apartment with a really cute little courtyard out in the back. I'm very excited. I can't wait to have my coffee on the courtyard and then walk Savannah's downtown in the morning with the... Oh my God, yeah. we're going to be able to walk in the morning and go through Savannah. Oh, we're gonna, we are. And wow. then we're going to be able to... I'm going to be able to take you all the places that I've already seen and be like, oh my God, this is my town that I act like I know everything. Yeah, right. You know, I can't I mean, wait. That's okay, I love that. I can't wait to be I your tour guide. I'll be my tour guide. I'll be your tour guide. I mean, we are going to... Like, have a real tour guide, because we're going to do a ghost tour. Oh, of course we are. And we made reservations for, what's the restaurant? The famous, the Pink House? The Old Pink House. The Old Pink House. And they have a cool, like, downstairs basement bar we're going to go to. And there's we're going to go to a rooftop bar, which is the opposite of a basement Completely. bar. Completely. <laughs> From high to below, you know? So, um, basically, we're going to have a badass uh, bestie trip. Oh, we're also going to river walk. We're going to go to Savannah's Candy Kitchen. I love candy. We're going to go to the Moon River Brewing Company because oh, guess yes. what, everybody? I'm doing a story on that today for you. Oh, surprise. So surprise for that. We're going to tie that back in for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to just see pretty much everything we can that's haunted, which is the whole city. And then we're going to walk and walk and walk and walk. So get ready for about 20 miles of walking. That's fine. I've got walking shoes. Good. I'm good. And we're going to be getting our drinks on. Yes. We because will. we're celebrating your fucking birthdays. Yeah. We're actually going to be going on the trip right before we come back to record for season three. So yeah, well, on our season premiere, we'll have a lot of stories to share. I cannot wait to come back and share them all with you. Same. But I'm going to let you know most of that talking because I've already told so many Savannah stories. I'm going to continue to tell them. Of course. But from the eyes of somebody that's never been there, I think your perception is going to be amazing being so excited yeah, and being new to it. Right. And um, everything I've been telling you is going to kind of make sense now. So you're going to be able to do that in the eyes of you. Yeah. So really cool. Well, um, I would like to tell you and all of our other um, LGBTQ listeners that happy Pride Month. Thank you. You know what's weird about being gay, especially for me, because I feel like I don't need to be loud, proud, and shout it to the rooftops to be secure with my sexuality and orientation. But I do appreciate, love, celebrate it, will be an advocate for anything that comes my way when it comes to... Uh, having to defend my people and my culture. Yeah. But I'm not somebody that likes to go to Pride, mainly because Florida's hot as fuck during <laughs> Pride. Also, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying that things are going to happen, but I would be concerned about safety. Well, there was a recent FBI ban you know? on, or a warning trying to tell people not to go to Pride events. 
because there is some sort of movement underground mm. or supposedly underground that is starting to form an anti-LGBTQ plus community hate group. So, oh, well, And they're threatening things during these events, basically telling people not to attend them because they're threatening violence. And it's disgusting. It's hateful. It's wrong. And I think a lot of people are like, no, I'm not going to be scared of this. You're not going yeah. to stop me from attending this. This is what you're trying to do. But ultimately, it is dangerous and it is a risk. And that risk for me is just not something I'm willing to take right, right. now. Right. And unfortunately, that proves why pride is needed. Yes. <laughs> you know? I mean, just, just things like that. And still in the year 2024, it's... So I, can, I, I really can't fathom. I it's can't crazy. either. I can't. But I'm going to support it on our podcast. I'm going to support it on our socials. I'm going to support it on my personal pages, my LinkedIn, everywhere I can. I'll have discussions with people in person. If it comes to me needing to help educate somebody that I believe needs to be a little less ignorant in their life... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and if you have anything to say in regards to that, feel free to have an educated conversation with me. Of course. I think uh, if you just have it in your mind, the less you care about what people are doing in the bedroom, the more that you will um, will live a little easier and sleep a little better. I think that's probably the easiest thing that I can say to people yeah. that have a little bit of hate. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's where I'll say I, I appreciate you supporting Pride and let me go on this little tangent real quick. I'm an uh, ally AF. Always. Appreciate it. So yeah, support the Pride, support the gays support everyone else in between and if you don't you don't have to be hateful about it um, just really shut the fuck up literally so yeah. thank you for that <laughs> um what else is going on in the world of things? well this week it was announced that the chicago bears which you know you may or may not know that i'm obsessed with i do i've heard that um the chicago bears have been selected to be on hbo's hard knocks which is a show that goes over the um like the teams on training camp. Okay. So they're going to be like featured and it starts in August. And um, I'm really excited for this season. So All right. I'm excited for the show and the football season. And uh, go Bears. I love the Bears. I know literally nothing about anything <laughs> you just said, but I'm very excited that mm-hmm. you are excited about yeah. it. So. I'm just not into sports the way that a lot of people are. I wish I were. It's just most people aren't into it as much as even me. So it's you know, it's, it's just obsess- I just don't even understand. I, I don't yeah. even understand it. And I'm truthfully, I don't even have enough time with everything else I watch. You have plenty of time. I, I just don't know that I want to find the time for okay. sports. Oh, well, as maybe that. Maybe just the Bears. Uh, why would I do that? Okay. I have. I'm from Michigan, <laughs> so I support the Lions. No. And I'm from now Florida for the last ten years, so I support everything Florida and okay. Tampa Bay. I love the Bucks. I love the Bucks. I love the Bucks I love also. The Lightning in the hockey realm. I love the Red Wings in You're the hockey realm. You're just not going to sit down and watch. A I'm bunch just of not. Games. I'll support you from afar, but Thank I'm just you. not going to do that. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, well then, what have you been doing? Uh, well, I've been continuing my True Blood trend. You have. We are now on season two, so I finally have been able to finish season one, which I have told you and some listeners out there before that I had as a gap in my True Blood journey because I just never watched it. And it was an earlier time in the early 2000s. We never had the time to go back and... Or I never found the time to go back. Well, it was not like the binging the way you could not. It was different. It's different. It was a different time. It was different. But you know. now I found the opportunity because Dylan is now interested after years of me begging him to watch it. That uh, I watched it. And I will say that I fell asleep in the season finale. <laughs> so I'm kind of mad about that. But I remember what happened based on season two. So I pieced it all together. Dylan well, and filled Dylan, me yeah, in. Yeah, he filled, he filled you in. So I'm so. good. But I, yeah, fuck Renee. Uh, from True Blood. Oh, I was like, oh, wow, not you. great, thanks. <laughs> not you, Renee and True Blood. <laughs> had, to, had to make that clear, I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, he was Fuck great. that guy. Not great at all. But now we're on season two and Marianne can fuck off too. I forgot about her. Mm-hmm. It's been a long time. So I'm remembering all these things I forgot about and now Dylan's really interested and woo, it's really fun. All right, yeah, nice. so that's what's going on there and uh, gosh, what else is going on? Oh yeah, I'm doing a ton of home showings. Kind of. Are you? For our home. <laughs> are you? <laughs> well, we have them planned. See, the problem is people are not considerate. I know. For example, we try to accommodate. We both have nine to five jobs. My husband works from home. Uh, we have two dogs that are small and that are very yippy. And they want to attack anyone that is not someone that they recognize. So when they see someone new or there's a new presence they sense, they just freak out. You can't calm them down. Even if they're in the cage, it just takes up the entire house with sound. But we've been trying to be negotiable, and when we can meet, 
Uh, people are wanting to meet us at like Tuesday at 11 a.m. or 1 p.m. and Dylan's working. I'm not there, so I can't support the cleaning and helping him get the dogs ready right. and everything like that. Or they'll be like, hey, on Saturday, can we do it at noon? And I'll commit to a noon time. And then they'll be like, oh, actually, can I do it at 1030? Well, no, I, I can't do that. We have something going on. But I can do noon, like you said. Well, I need to be earlier. Well, you didn't need to be earlier because you just told me that noon was fine. Right. So something else was a different priority for you, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be for me. So we still live here. We still have lives. Um, but we can make 11 work. And then they just cancel altogether. That's great. We, were, we That's couldn't even great. really make 11 work, but we were willing to do it because we want to get this fucking home sold. Yeah. But because it wasn't in their exact way they wanted it, they canceled the show. So then it just like... Waste your time. And Waste my time. Everything, yeah. And then yesterday, my real estate agent calls and is like, hey, we how about tonight at uh, 8 p.m.? And it was noon. I had plenty of time. It still wasn't 24 hours like has been requested because, again, we live here. But I was able to make it work. I did a little bit of cleaning. Not a full deep clean like I normally do for a showing. But then she's like, yeah, they just canceled. It's 4 p.m. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? Like, what is wrong with people? Now, I guess if you're already looking earlier that day and you find one you love and you put an offer in, okay, I get that. Yeah, but I mean, it's happened, like, so many times. So many times. I feel times. like that's not, like, But I'm starting to lose everyone. hope in, like, humanity, yeah, <laughs> honestly. If I even had any before. But, yeah, it's been definitely annoying. I will probably never sell another home again if I don't have to. Just right. because it really disrupts lives. <laughs> and every time we got to do a show, we got to leave. We got to get the dogs. We got to put them in our trunk. Then we got to wait, and then we got to come back. And then they're late. They don't show up on time. Let's just hold on one second. You just said, let's just make sure our, our listeners know that you have an SUV, so you're not really put, like putting the dogs like, in the trunk of a car <laughs> because the way... <laughs> Put the dogs in the trunk. You're putting them in like the hatch or the... I have a Kia Sportage. It's a very nice car. <laughs> And they're going to be just safe and sound. Exactly. Well, I was just making sure that everyone's aware that you're not just... And it's also air-conditioned you know, and we're in Florida. Shoving them in a truck. And they're in a blanket mm -hmm. and they're very spoiled. No, that's fine. You know. uh, yes. Thank yeah, you for okay. helping me clarify that I'm not a, a dog abuser. Yeah, that would be... Lose the know, custody of my fucking yeah, dogs. Right, literally. Thank you for having my back there. <laughs> but yeah, and my tangent. So thanks for stopping that. I appreciate that. Because I could have gone on all day. Of course. Of and course. yeah, obviously I'm still mad. But it's fine. So the weird thing, ironically... It's hurricane season here in Florida now. Yeah, let's add that to how I'm going to show homes during that. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, however, it's been really dry. Like, it hasn't... When's the last time it rained? Like, I want to say... Like, my backyard is crispy. Late April, when my parents were in town? Right around my birthday. Yeah. It was like the week after, I feel like. So, it's like, you know, hurricanes... However, I think you said that you saw on the news that there are some, like, happenings going on in the tropics or whatever. I believe there was four. Okay. Four tropical storms or So then I guess the rain will be coming then. Yeah, hopefully. So. It doesn't feel like it. My grass is damn straw. Yeah, but I mean, if stuff is happening in the tropics, then eventually that's making its way over here. Yeah, I mean. It, it better because I'm sure when people pull up to my except property. I don't want it like really to. No, I don't want a hurricane. Oh, yeah, I don't want that. But I, I want, want water on my lawn. Some wa yeah, just a little bit of water on the lawn would be nice. And my pool know? needs a little water. If you could please fill that up so I don't have to pay yeah. for that. So uh, if Florida could do what Florida does and, and rain, then, you know. It's been a very weird year for weather. Yeah. Because normally we get heavy rains in May. We did not. No, like nothing. Normally we get the, like, torrential downpours, I believe, in the beginning of June. And, I mean, we're only on the second day of June, but shit, it feels yeah, like it's... we should have something. Yeah, well. So, I don't know. I mean, this might be a bad calm before the storm. I'm a little well, worried. I mean, what? The Florida. Florida. <laughs> I just transitioned my way right, right there. You did because we were talking about Florida. Good smooth so. little segue. I mean, you like that? I loved it. I thought. Do you like it? I do like it. <laughs> but what I do like is when you tell me stories about crazy Florida shit. So right. I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to you, okay. and you're gonna take it away. So the first one that we're gonna talk about is entitled "Florida Teen Boards Wrong Flight Ends Up in Puerto Rico Instead of Ohio." <laughs> That's quite <laughs> a difference. Is... <laughs> It's really close. <laughs> Quite a difference. <laughs> a Florida father was baffled after he found out his teenage son boarded the wrong flight and ended up in Puerto Rico. Ryan Luz told WKMG this was the first time his 16-year-old son Logan flew by himself. 
The boy was supposed to fly from Tampa to Cleveland, Ohio through Frontier Airlines, but an employee didn't scan his boarding pass before he went on an incorrect flight. As a result, Logan found himself alone in San Juan. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. If he would have landed in, a, in another state, I could have just gotten a car and drove and had him on the phone and say, hey, Logan, just don't do anything. Just stay there. I'll be there in X amount of hours. I can't do that when he's in Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. The following day, the 16-year-old was flown back to Tampa and made it to Cleveland, according to reporters. Frontier said the mix-up happened because the flights departed from the same gate. The company has also apologized to the boy's family for the mistake. They offered me a voucher to an airline that just lost my son, (laughs) Luz told the news station. I want accountability. These airlines are not being held accountable. The airline allows passengers who are 15 and older to fly alone, and they don't have a program that monitors and escorts unaccompanied minors on flights. Last week, a six-year-old boy was put on the wrong flight alone to Florida days before Christmas. I have a... How the and then that's I, the end of the article? They just leave us hanging there? How does that even happen? I don't even... Like, I don't even... Year, I can't... Absolutely not. I don't even understand. Wow. But what I do understand is that I have another article for you. Uh, and this is go. another with the Florida. And this happened to be taking place on January 30th of this year. And it is called Florida Woman Tries to Kill Husband Over Postcard from Ex-Girlfriend, Cops wow. Say. Uh, this woman is very... Um, she's been through it. She's, <laughs> she's been through it. Put up hard, laid out wet. <laughs> Man. I, I definitely said that wrong, didn't I? I know what you meant. Yes. I know, but I know exactly thank what you, you thank meant. Thank you for and, that. <laughs> and I think everyone knows what you yes, meant. Yes, she's, mm-hmm. she's that. Wow. Authorities in Florida arrested a woman accused of trying to kill her husband after he received... From a woman he dated over 60 years ago. Bertha Yalter, 71, is facing three charges, including attempted murder over an incident that happened in a North Miami Beach gated community on Sunday, January 28th, according to WPLG. Officers responded to an apartment near the intersection of Northeast 169th Street and 35th Avenue. The victim told officers his wife tried to kill him after the postcard arrived at their home, noting the sender was his ex-girlfriend. An arrest report reads... Documents claim Yalter became upset and started trying to smother her husband. Investigators also reported the victim was, quote, extremely fragile and suffered, quote, several serious bruises and open lacerations, as well as open bite marks that were bleeding. Bite marks that were bleeding? This bitch is crazy. Girl! Officials also obtained video of the brutal attack. Wow. Yalter confessed to attacking her husband while speaking to the officers, the police report reveals. Officers arrested the 71-year-old wife at the apartment around 3.40 p.m. that day and booked her into jail. She was held without bond on charges of attempted murder, aggravated battery on a person who is 65 or older, and tampering with a victim, according to reporters. And we don't have any updates on her either. But I'm going to assume she's in there for a long time. Yeah, wow, that's that's something. (laughs) That is something. All right. You know what? You going to go first this week? You want to change it up? Yeah, I'd love to go first this week. All right. Give it a so whirl. So I'm going to. I'm going to tell everybody about um, this man called Oba Chandler. I'm going to assume he sucks. He does suck. Okay. He's a bitch. Okay. And so, yeah, let's talk about him. Let's do it. Oba Chandler was born October 11th, 1946 and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm just going to point out he was born on 10-11. Okay. I hate him already, but he's born on 10 11 and he has yeah. a cool birthday. That's all. <laughs> he was the fourth of five children born to Oba Chandler Sr. and Margaret Johnson. When he was only 10 years old, his father hanged himself in the basement of the family apartment in June of 1957. Oh. Yeah. Uh, one of the sisters actually found him. How terrible. Which is awful. He was so upset that at the funeral, 10-year-old Oba jumped into his father's open grave as the grave diggers were covering the coffin with dirt. Can you imagine being people Apparently at the funeral? Apparently, he, like, stom- he was, like, jumping up and down oh, and stomping. No, I know. No. So, so he really didn't... It didn't start off well for him. Ugh. That's, like, a, a terrible age for that to happen. Not that it would ever be a good no. age, but... But such a yeah. developmental year that it would just really fuck you up. Yeah. And when he was 14, he began stealing cars and was arrested over 20 times as a juvenile before the age of 18. As an adult, he was charged with a variety of crimes, including possession of counterfeit money, loitering, burglary, kidnapping, and armed robbery. So he was just 
doing it all. He was just not good. Not all good. when he was fourteen. No, no, oh. this was one, no, this was as an adult. This okay. was just he was regardless, just constantly wow. committing crimes. Sure. Now, as if that wasn't enough, he was also accused of being a peeping Tom and was caught touching himself while peeping through women's windows. Disgusting. So that's really gross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In one incident, Chandler and an accomplice broke into a Florida couple's home, held them at gunpoint, and robbed them. Chandler told his accomplice to tie up the man with speaker wire and took the woman to the bedroom where he made her strip her her underwear tied her up, and rubbed the barrel of his gun across her stomach. Disgusting. So he didn't actually, like, sexually assault her or anything, but he did derive, like, sexual pleasure from just being disgusting. <laughs> That's terrible. Mm -hmm. On May 26th, 1989, Joan Rogers, who went by Joe, 36 years old, and her daughters Michelle, who was 17, and Christy, who was 14, left their family dairy farm in Wilshire, Ohio, for a vacation in Florida. All right. It was the first time that any of them had ever left Ohio. June 1st, 1989, which was... June Literally was yesterday. yesterday. I know, and I was, as I was, like, researching and writing this story, it was June 1st, which was just a weird There's coincidence. There's coincidences all over our stories. I know, that was a weird We don't mean this, I promise. <laughs> so June 1st, 1989 was the last day that Joe and her daughters were seen alive. Authorities believe Joe became, became lost on the return drive from Orlando, so they had decided to take an extra vacation day in Tampa, which I'm not understanding how that's possible or how that happened because Orlando's north, so if they were driving back to Ohio, but somehow she might have actually, maybe she went south instead of north. Is what is maybe I'm gathering. Well, my guess is that they took <clears throat> 75 down, which means they would have just went straight south, which would have led them to Tampa first. But well, that... no, it was basically they were supposed to return home on like May 31st uh -huh. from Orlando back to Ohio. Somehow they ended up in Tampa. So I'm thinking she ended up accidentally going south instead of north. Then they were like, oh, crap. Let's just stay an extra day in Tampa. So that's kind of what authorities are. I wonder when are. they figured it out, because that's like an hour and a half, two I know. hours away. I know. Well, I mean, at this point, I mean, this is, you know, like the late 80s. There's not cell phones and things like that. I mean, yeah. and things were different then, I true, guess. True. So they, they just decided, no big deal. We'll go ahead and just stay an extra day in Tampa. All right, all right. Um, while looking for a hotel, they encountered Chandler, who gave them directions and offered to meet them later to take them on a sunset cruise of Tampa Bay. Not a bad idea. Right. Great time. And, and of course, and if you're thinking like, hey, we have this extra vacation day, let's make let's make the best of it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. They checked into the Days Inn on Route 60 at 12.30 p.m. So they, there is record of that. All right. Pictures retrieved from, from a roll of film found in a camera in their hotel room showed Michelle sitting on the floor. The very last photo was taken from the hotel balcony, showing the beginning, showing the beginning of the sun setting over Tampa Bay. So all three were still alive before the sunset. They were last seen at the hotel restaurant around 7:30 p.m. It's believed that they boarded Chandler's boat by the dock on Courtney Campbell Causeway between 8:30 p.m. and 9 p.m. and that they were dead by 3 a.m. the next day. You know what's weird is I used to take that literal road to work every day yeah i used to work um right off of the courtney campbell causeway like right before it so yeah it's it's crazy to do a, a local story because you know i mean you i mean we live here it's, it's just literal home it's just weird you yeah. know yeah it's crazy chandler may have used the fact that he was from ohio to lure them into feeling a connection with him because he was originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. He would have seen the Ohio license plates on Joe's vehicle. So that's, you know, what authorities are, you know, obviously sure. they're, they don't know. But right. They're speculating. Yeah. On June 4th, 1989, the first body was found when a sailboat was crossing under the Sunshine Skyway and several people on board saw an object floating in the water. The second body was seen floating off the pier in St. Petersburg, two miles north of the first. The third body was seen floating 200 yards to the east while the Coast Guard was recovering the second. All three female bodies were found floating face down, bound with a rope around the neck, and naked below the waist. Autopsies showed all three victims had water in their lungs, 
which means that they were thrown into the water while still alive. Oh, no. Yeah. Michelle, who was identified as the second body found, had managed to free one hand from her bonds before she drowned. So she was try- She was struggling. She tried, you know. Sure. The partially dressed state of the bodies indicated that the underlying crime was probably sexual assault. Ropes with a concrete block at the other end had been tied around the victim's necks to ensure that they died from either suffocation or drowning and that they would never be found. However, the bodies bloated as a result of decomposition and floated to the surface. How? Oh, no. It's just all, it, it's terrible detail. It's it terrible. is terrible. Mm-hmm. Their bodies underwent extensive decomposition while underwater due to the hot weather in the bay. Because of this, they were actually not identified for a week after they were found. By this time, Joe's husband and the girl's father, Hal Rogers, had reported them missing in Ohio. On June 8th, a housekeeper at the Days Inn said that Rogers' family's that the Rogers family's room had not been disturbed at all and the beds had not been slept in. At this time, the hotel manager contacted the police. Fingerprints found in the room were matched to the bodies, and final confirmation came from dental records. Oh. Marine researchers at the University of South Florida estimated from currents and patterns that the victims were thrown from a boat and not from a bridge or dry land between two and five days before they were found, which that's fascinating that they can tell those details based on patterns and currents that how they were able to tell that it was from a boat and not like from like a bridge or something like that. You well, know? I guess if they, I guess it would be from where they were found. Like, could it have made it in what amount of time or, and if they were in deeper waters out with deeper, rougher current conditions, yeah, maybe they were, cause it, or it depends on, you know, it was June. So there could have been a hurricane. There could have been storms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, who knows? I just think it's cool that they were able to, that they can determine. I, I love science. Yeah. So, yeah. And this is before technology, too. Exactly. Yeah, that's crazy. Right. Joe's car, a 1987 Oldsmobile with Ohio license plates, was found at the boat dock by the Courtney Campbell Causeway. Joan, Michelle, and Chrissy Rogers were buried in their hometown on June 13th, 1989. That's literally my best friend's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> year, I think it's the same year too. Like, yeah, wow. Stacy's birthday. Stacy, I know. Another shout out for Stacy. Stacy, number one, number one fan. Right. <laughs> um. Anyway, she was. <laughs> they were buried after a funeral service attended by about three hundred family members and friends. Numerous police officers were present to keep reporters and television crews out of the church during the service. Which, like, let people grieve their family like leave them the fuck alone honestly that's not how the paparazzi works no not at all Mm -hmm. the case actually remained unsolved for over three years like they were and i guess there were like not really any leads at all that's really sad the police found handwritten directions though on a brochure in joe's vehicle Now, when they had run out of other leads, they ended up posting images of that brochure on billboards around the Tampa Bay area just to see if anyone recognized the handwriting. A former neighbor of Oba Chandler ended up recognizing it, which which is crazy, and provided a copy of a work order that Chandler had written. Which wouldn't have that much handwriting on it. Right? Wow. Through handwriting analysis, the two samples were matched. A palm print on the brochure was also matched to Chandler, who had sold his boat and left town with his family soon after the billboards appeared, which isn't suspicious at all, you know. Uh (laughs) Police reported that he and his then wife moved from their home in Tampa to Port Orange, which is near Daytona Beach. Chandler was arrested for the murders on September 24th, 1992. And, you know, of course, we don't really know anything about the wife, but I wonder what she was thinking. You know, was she an accomplice? Did she know? What would she, what would she have been told? Hey, we have to hurry up and move. Yeah. Like, how does that work? Like when you're, I will say though, I mean, sometimes, and I know that wasn't that long ago necessarily, but certainly there a lot of times what, what, what the man says goes. Yeah. And it could, you know, it could be as simple as that. Or maybe I, she was scared of him and he was abusive. Who which, knows? Exactly. You know, obviously, he had those tendencies. So, yeah, so maybe she was just scared of him and had to do it. So she lived. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, investigators had initially thought that two men were involved in the murders. This theory was actually reenacted in a 1991 episode of Unsolved Mysteries, 
which I want to go back and watch just because I love you know, Mysteries. yes, that's where we actually found the Chuck Morgan case. Oh, yeah, that's where that yeah. originated from. Um, but that was that theory was dismissed when Chandler was arrested. No evidence was ever found to indicate that a second man was involved. At one point, Hale Rogers' brother John was considered a suspect, even though he was serving a prison sentence for the rape of a woman at the time of the murders. Police investigating the women's rape allegation found evidence indicating John had also been sexually assaulting Michelle Rogers, his niece. Yuck. Those charges were eventually dropped only due to Michelle's refusal to testify. Probably due to fear. But yeah, of, of course. Right. Um, uh, it was speculated that John may have planned the murder during a visit to his parents' property near Tampa a month before the murders. However, once the police established that John could not have hired a contract killer, did not have any accomplices, and could not have even known the timing of the trip, he was dismissed as a suspect. Damn. So, disgusting person, but not responsible for the murder. <laughs> yeah. Hal was also previously considered a suspect, but investigations proved conclusively that Hal had not left Ohio during that period and could not have been involved. Damn. And he lost his whole family. And poor thing. Right. And then he was a suspect. Like, ugh. I, and I get it. I know I'm... You have to go through the motions. You have to, but, you know. Yeah. That sucks. At his trial in Clearwater, Florida, which we're very familiar with, Absolutely. <laughs> Chandler said that he met Joe, Michelle, and Christy Rogers and gave them the directions, but never saw them again, except for the newspapers and billboards. He acknowledged that he was in Tampa Bay that night, but he maintained that he had been fishing alone. He said that he had returned home late because his engine wouldn't start, which he attributed to a gas line leak. He also said that he had called the Coast Guard and the Florida Marine Patrol and had flagged down a patrol boat, but both were too busy to help. Um, he said that he ended up fixing the line himself with duct tape and returned safely to shore. There were, however, no records of distress calls from Chandler to either the Coast Guard or Marine Patrol that mm, night. Weird. <laughs> yeah. And according to a boat mechanic who testified for the prosecution, Chandler's explanation of repairing the alleged gas leak was not possible because the fuel lines in his boat were directed upward. A leak would have sprayed fuel into the air rather than into the boat, and the gasoline would have dissolved the adhesive of the duct tape. Science again! Bitch. Yes. Yes, I love science. Yeah. <laughs> Chandler was found guilty of the murders and was sentenced to death on November 4th, 1994. He maintained his innocence and continued to pursue legal appeals while on Florida's death row. Chandler awaited execution of a sentence at the Union Correctional Institution. Shortly after the trial and conviction, his wife, Deborah, filed for divorce and their marriage was dissolved a year later. Good for her. He was no longer allowed to see his daughter, Whitney, and in accordance with his ex-wife's wishes, he was not even allowed to see later photographs of her. Good for her. Mm -hmm. Great. So she clearly was not a, yep. an accomplice. Now we have you know? answer. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Profiling experts speculate that Chandler may have killed previously based on the belief that a first-time killer would not be experienced or bold enough to abduct and kill three women at once. True. You know, and, and it's not, because it's not like it was like a woman, oh, I mean, sorry, a woman and two small children. I mean, they were 17 and 14. Yeah. I mean, you know, so yeah. Awful. After his conviction, Chandler was named by the media as one of Florida's most notorious criminals. One of the jurors in his 1994 trial said, quote, he scared some of the jurors when he would sit and stare at you and have that stupid grin on his face. He would make your skin crawl. Yeah, because then you wonder, what if he's not convicted and then he's memorized how you look? I would be scared well, as a juror, to yeah. be honest. You know, like, yeah. Creepy motherfucker. Literally. Judge Susan F. Schaefer, whom presided over the trial and ultimately sentenced Chandler, described him as, quote, a man with no soul. She said it's the worst case as far as factually and as far as a defendant without saving grace that I ever handled. And I represented plenty of people who were not necessarily good people. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. On October 10th, 2011, which was one day before his birthday, actually. Yeah. Governor Rick Scott signed Chandler's death warrant. 
His execution was set for November 15th, 2011 at 4 p.m. At that time, he was suffering from high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, problems with his kidneys, and arthritis. So he told his lawyer not to file any frivolous appeals to keep him alive. On November 15th, Chandler was executed at 4.08 p.m. by lethal injection at Florida State Prison in Rayford. He declined to make a last statement before being executed, but did leave a written statement with prison officials. Quote, you are killing an innocent man today. You bastard. Yeah, right. After his execution, Chandler was described as the loneliest man in the loneliest place on earth, death row. He did not receive one single visitor during his years on Florida's death row. I find that amazing. And he had several children. He had multiple children. Like adult children. They clearly all knew who he was. Yeah. Now, this normally would be the end of the story, but it's, we have like one, yeah. We have a twist? Well, not really. Well, kind of, yeah. Okay. (laughs) On February 25th, 2014, investigators revealed the DNA evidence that identified Chandler as the murderer of 20-year-old Ivelisse Berrios Beggaris, who was raped and strangled in Coral Springs, Florida, on November 27th, 1990. So he had... Well, this was actually after the murders of the three, um, the Rogers family. Yeah. But DNA evidence proved that he had murdered Ivelisse. Wow. She was last seen at Sawgrass Mills Mall, where she worked at a sporting goods store. When she did not return home, her husband went to the mall and found her car with the tires slashed. It is believed that Chandler slashed her tires and arrived in the guise of a helpful stranger and offered to help. Of course he did. Mm-hmm. Three hours after she was reported missing, her body was found under a residential mailbox in a local neighborhood by two men returning from a fishing trip. He just laid her at the bottom of a fucking mailbox? <laughs> yep. Oh, I want to oh, I want to kill him myself. Come back to life so I can do it, you bastard. (laughs) Her body was naked and had ligature marks on both wrists and legs, and brown tape stuck to her hair. Her murder has now been considered solved and closed. Law enforcement agencies across the state have also looked into other cold cases across Florida, but nothing else has ever been connected to Chandler at this time. But they are still, I mean, there's a lot to go through. So they're still trying. Florida be crazy. And that's... This, my story on Oba Chandler, who wow. sucks. Love your story. Fucking hate him. Yes. Yeah. Well, we hate everybody in my stories. Everybody. All the, all the murderers. Yeah. Okay. Well, now that we're done talking about that asshole, um, I would like to hear some haunted things. Like haunted shit? I like haunted shit. Okay. Well, I'm going to continue on my Savannah saga. Of course. You like that? Yeah. I just figured I would do a couple more Savannah stories since we're going to be talking about some haunted shit. Uh, well, they're interesting. So and there's why not? so many of them that yeah. I could go on for days Take your about pick, them. honestly. But again, I mentioned earlier that we're going to be talking about the Moon River Brewing Company. And I want to talk about why people think of Savannah and what they think about Savannah when they go there and what makes them think about, you know. You know, if you're in Florida, you think about beaches. Savannah, mm-hmm. you think about cobblestone bricks. You think about rustic decor, great weather, bars, music, restaurants for miles. But we also, to add a little bit of charm, you love the Spanish moss dripping from almost every tree in Savannah. But, you know, like me and most people, they think of haunted establishments, usually as haunted houses, old hospitals, or worn down buildings. Sometimes, though, these hauntings happen in places that we pass every day and we don't even realize it. Some of these haunted buildings are even those in which you share memories with loved ones, laughs, or even just a bite to eat on a Friday night. And that is where the Moon River Brewing Company comes in. In downtown Savannah, in the historic district, we're going to get our time machine. We're going to activate it to the past because we're going to be traveling back to where it all began in the year 1821. I wish time machines were real. I do too. I would love that. Oh my that. gosh. Did you ever watch that show? I think it was ABC called Timeless, I believe. No. You might want to go watch that if okay. you're into it. Because they actually have found a way to get into time travel. And they go back in time. And they go to different places. Like the um, Lindenberg disaster. When that happened, they try to change it. And they realize, you know, you can't really affect time. You're supposed to go in and observe so you can learn right. from it. 
Um, but they try to change it, of course, and things happen. Well, remember the Stephen King book? Uh, you know, yes, yeah. but yes, definitely I'm not watch get on that. A tangent. Okay, cool. absolutely. So back to 1821, <laughs> we're going to start with Eliezer Early, an American hotel mogul who ended up building Savannah's first hotel, designed by renowned architect William J. Early, a descendant of English immigrant John Early, was born in Orange County, Virginia, in early 1779. His parents were Joel Early and Lucy Smith. The family at some point moved to Charleston, South Carolina, and then the family had moved to Wilkes County, Georgia by 1790. Eliezer's brother, Peter Early, was a future governor of the state of Georgia who ran in office from January 10, 1803 to March 3, 1807. A family feud led to Joel Early disinheriting his son, which led to Eliezer becoming a businessman that he eventually became, and then in 1799, Early was a merchant in Augusta, Georgia. And after being declared bankrupt in 1802, the following year, Eliezer married Jane Merriweather Patterson in Richmond County, Georgia. Jane had inherited handsomely from her maternal uncle, Thomas Merriweather, passing eventually and then giving all of his goods and inheritance to her. This eventually helped Eliezer fund his dreams of building and operating a hotel business. Early's new sister-in-law, Susanna, had recently become the third wife of Daniel Sturgis Jr., a Georgia state surveyor. Susanna died around 1811, shortly after giving birth to a daughter, Jane Louisa Sturgis. A year after the death of Susanna, Susanna's husband was jailed for debt, which obviously, you know, this is not going well for the family. Uh, because then, this led to the earliest fostering in the niece and taking her in full time, changing her last name to their own. Um, you know, then, unfortunately, their niece, Jane, died around 12 years later. Hmm. I know. To touch on the Eliezer's career, one of Early's first roles was a comptroller general for the state of Georgia between 1806 and 1809 when David Birdie Mitchell was elected as governor. Mitchell instead made him secretary in an executive department. He ran for the office of Secretary of State for Georgia State Legislature but was defeated by Horatio Murberry. The Earlys returned to Early's former home at Augusta in 1810. Savannah, Georgia became the Early's first family home in 1816. Eliezer began working as a cashier at the Bank of the State of Georgia, but transferred a short time later to the newly established Second Bank of the United States. Another map was engraved by Samuel Harrison in 1818. The following year, Early is listed as having paid $23.25 taxes on three slaves, a carriage, and a building on two lots in Savannah, valued at $7,000. Now, this time I did research because okay. I forgot last week. Now, it was actually kind of surprising because I thought it would be a little more. But today's money, that's $221,700.61. Okay. Roughly four years after the sale of the land of his wife, Eliezer built Savannah's first hotel, which was then called the City Hotel by its original name. Not only was it the first hotel in Savannah, but it had also become home to the first branch of the United States Post Office for Savannah. It also served as the branch of the Bank of the United States, and it must have been kind of convenient having a hotel, post office, and bank and bar on I mean, literally, just room. like, I mean, one-stop shop. <laughs> one-stop shop. <laughs> During the hotel's tenure, many notable people stayed here. The guests included the War of 1812 hero Winifeld Scott, the Marquis de Lafayette, the first mm -hmm. three Commodores of the United States Navy, and naturalist James Audubon. Audubon stayed around six months at the hotel while attempting to sell books that he was doing based on wildlife sketches. That's cool because I actually know his sketches. Like, you do? Yeah, like so he does like like I said, wildlife, like birds and things like that. I've I've definitely like seen his and it's just like a cool little. And now you know that he because, stayed at the hotel. I know. It's that just is little, now the Moon River Brewing Company. You know, yeah. And you're going to go visit it. So how cool is that? Tie it all back in. Yeah, I am. In 1851, businessman Peter Wiltberger bought the city hotel. He renovated it and put on a live lion and lioness on display in the front to draw attention to wow. the business. The attraction must not have given the lasting marketing effects that he wanted because the city's hotel final guest checkout was 1864, just before the arrival of General Tecumseh Sherman during the War of Northern Aggression and the subsequent closing of the hotel. General Sherman claimed the city and his famous march to the sea during this time in the American Civil War. 
The building also served as the hospital during Savannah's numerous yellow fever outbreaks. During these outbreaks, when the building functioned as a makeshift hospital, and this was, of course, happening because American soldiers had invaded Savannah and forced most of the town businesses to halt what they were doing and to start helping and housing wounded soldiers. Hundreds of people, mostly children, had reportedly died on the upper floors of the building, even though they died all over the hotel. It's not surprising that the child spirits are often seen in the Moon River Burn Company up there. Creepy children again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At the turn of the century, the building was used as a lumber and coal warehouse. As the use of coal slowly died off throughout history, the building was then used for general storage. In the 60s, the space was renovated as an office supply store, completing with also a large printing press in the building as well. The building sat empty for almost 20 years, and then around 1995, when it was renovated into its current business as a brew pub, the Moon River Brewing Company debuted the space on April 10th, 1999, and is now a staple in the Savannah community. So, a few fun facts about this. The Moon River Brewing Company has been featured in several media hotspots and shows. In 2005, the brewery was featured in Ghost Hunters on their Halloween special. In 2009, it was also on Travel Channel's paranormal television series, Ghost Adventures. And in 2018, on an episode of BuzzFeed's Unsolved Supernatural. Moon River Brewing Company was also featured as a haunted location on paranormal TV series, Most Terrifying Places, which aired on the Travel Channel in 2019. Another fun fact is that this is the first place that Dylan and I actually ate and visited after we put our things in the Marshall House upon our first vacation. And then we went right there to eat because we were starving. We ate, and I was like, you know, let's see what else is haunted in the town. And then I realized that this was one of the most haunted places in Savannah. Oh, so you didn't even know. I had no idea until after we ate there that this was actually haunted and had the reputation that it did. Now that we've delved into a little bit of the dark history of the pub, I want to talk about what gives the building its reputation of rapturous. Rapturous. Starting at the bottom of things, meaning beginning with the ghosts that haunt the basement of the Moon River Brewing Company, arguably the most famous ghost of the Brewing Company is named Toby and is often seen wandering the basement. This is one of the ghosts that the staff see often enough that they decided he deserved a name. Not really sure where Toby came from. I don't think there's any substantiated evidence that has shown that anyone just named, named them, Toby died, you know? <laughs> but it could just be something one day was like, that's Toby, and then they just stuck with it. <laughs> the basement is widely regarded as the most active floor in the brewery it might not have the feeling as the top floor does or the violent history of the other floors but it certainly has the most ghost encounters toby is known to brush up against people playing in the billiard room and getting frustrated and also physically pushing them oh, that's great. you know toby, no big deal he's a little bitch that toby <laughs> there are a few people who will tell you that slaves were kept in the basement which would also certainly be a reason for people to believe there are spirits that linger there but there is no evidence that that's actually true either Still, the basement is where the people that have visited it or been on ghost tours have experienced a paranormal feeling and therefore is definitely worth visiting if you're in for a good scare. Even if you do not encounter a spirit, you're definitely going to see a beautiful building with tons of history, play a couple good games of billiard, and sip on some beer and have a good bite to eat with your friends. But people say that's actually where you get the most haunting experiences because there are so many people, people that actually go trying to do investigations there actually report that there's not a whole lot of happenings because of all the activity that's going on. Right. So they say go in at a later time where there's not a lot of people, eat with yourself and your friends, and just kind of be quiet and do a lot of observing. And a lot of people have been reported to find things happening then. So Say less. Right? Say less. (laughs) So something else that's also happened is other signs of hauntings. There's also been signs that have include sudden coldness, Bottles falling down or being thrown across the room. The feeling of being touched by someone who just isn't there. All of these reports from other patrons and staff have been enough to put the basement of the brewery onto many ghost tours and onto the other media channels that I mentioned prior. Yes. It's also a must-see place in Savannah. And I will be must-seeing it. Absolutely, you must see. (laughs) Many people who go on ghost tours throughout the Moon River Brewing Company make a stop at that basement due to the reputation for being that hoppet of activity. One tale is that of a ghost tour guest. A young woman started to panic. She claimed that her entire right hand and the side of her body became icy cold very quickly. She said that she could hear voices but couldn't make out exactly what they were saying. She was also escorted outside by somebody to which at that point... The creepy experience kind of like suddenly abruptly stopped. Mm. Was it caused by a ghost? You know, I don't know. But many people have reported feeling very similar feelings. And while they're there, 
they're also feeling it in the basement. So that's where this reputation's really started. Another account of haunted activity comes from that of the second floor, the famous shooting of James Stark took place. Born in 1805, Philip Manis was a physician and scion of an old Savannah family. James Jones Stark was a resident of Glynn County and a member of Georgia State Legislature. Now, I want to tell you that before I dive into this, the reason that I'm telling the story is because this was actually a pretty big deal in history. This was about a famous duel that happened between these two people. And back then, duels were scheduled murders. Yeah. That essentially, people went and watched you do in the middle of town. Yeah. And one or both concept. of you would die. Like super weird concept. <laughs> and if you broke any of the rules of the scheduled murder, you were then considered the outlaw and then were therefore punished by law. The friction between Stark and Minnis dated at least to the spring of 1832. According to Richard D. Arnold, a friend of Minnis's, Stark insulted the absent Minnis in Ludington's bar room, calling him a damn Jew who ought to be pissed upon and so forth. How be fucking pissed. insulting. Ought to be pissed upon. Correct. Wow. That would be worth a fucking duel, in my opinion, Literally. if you called me that. He declined to repeat the insults in Menace's presence and offered a private explanation deemed acceptable by a friend of Menace's. According to Menace's sister, Sarah, Stark made anti-Semitic comments directly to Menace in April, but offered an apology. In July, Stark denied having apologized for these comments. Menace then wrote to demand an apology or satisfaction, and Stark agreed to the duel. So now we're going to get into the duel. Okay. All right. On August 9th, the seconds, Thomas Wayne for Stark and Charles Spaulding for Menace, began their negotiations. So the seconds at that point were like the minutes okay, for yeah. the meeting. Spaulding did not agree to Wayne's proposal of rifles at Scrivens's Ferry, South Carolina, later in that afternoon. He objected that Menace's rifle, an unusual choice of weapon since most duels at that time were done with pistols, were being repaired and that the duel should be delayed at least until the following day. Stark and Wayne, nonetheless, crossed the river to Scrivens' ferry, discharged rifles, and declared victory. Their belligerences during a meeting on the street, coupled with rumors of Menace's coward attitude, ensured the f- that the feud would just not die. On August 10th, Menace and Spaulding went to the barroom of the city hotel. When informed of their presence, Stark and Wayne came downstairs. Menace called Stark a coward. Stark may have produced or reached for a pistol, and many accounts vary here. Menace shot him through the chest, killing him. Menace's friends persuaded him to relinquish his weapon to Spaulding, though not before he had threatened to fire into the crowd, and withdrew to his office to await the sheriff, who arrived within the hour. The coroner's inquest returned a verdict of deliberate murder. So basically, he shot him, he went fucking crazy, and then tried to shoot in the crowd like a psycho. Wow, okay. And that, at that point, was like, okay, now you clearly were having some vengeance here. You didn't do this the right way. Yeah. So then he went to trial, and now we'll talk about that. Okay. Menace's trial was delayed until a disinterested judge could then be found. Both principals had connections to the judiciary. Menace's father, Isaac, was a judge on the inferior court, and the superior court, Judge William Law, was related to Stark by marriage. Law's impartial look into the court may have been questioned for other reasons but he was also a member of the anti-dueling association and had suggested potentially prejudicial wording for a notice in the georgian which was a newspaper at the time to which editor richard d arnold objected judge charles daughtry was imported from the western circuit to preside over the trial in january 1833 It lasted six days, and after deliberating for two hours, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. Though many had initially believed Menace was guilty, public animosity apparently did not survive the acquittal, because then he rose to the ranks in the majority in the army and enjoyed a very successful career as a physician and businessman. Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. So, these are the stories that substantiate the Stark's ghost and is said to roam the floors of the Rune River Brewing Company. I almost, that was a tongue twister just now. I don't know why. <laughs> the next story is a personal recollection from an author of the Ghost City Tours website for the Moon River Brewing Company. And they called it Dine with Ghosts at Moon River. So, quote, I personally have been a witness to two events at Moon River, which can only be explained by the ghosts of the Moon River Brewing Company messing with people. Last summer, I was on a date with a lovely young lady. We went to the Moon River for dinner. During the course of the dinner, she excused herself to the restroom The minutes had ticked by as I started to wonder if she bailed on me. Almost 10 minutes later, she came back to the table, tears streaming down her face. I had asked her what was wrong. Is everything okay? 
After she had took a deep breath and composed herself, she proceeded to tell me that she was in one of the stalls. When she tried to exit the stall, the door wouldn't open. She assured me that the door wasn't locked. When she pushed on the door with all of her weight, the door would just not budge. She started to panic, but didn't want to cause a scene. For ten minutes? Ten minutes. Oh, man. I know. After trying for another minute, she desperately called out, let me out of the stall. She gave the door another push, and it came right open. Can you... <laughs> Can you imagine? Wow. It's like the ghost was like, bitch, all you have to do is ask. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? I yeah, I guess, right? Oh, Shit. Sorry. Yeah. Right. It she went outside to try to calm herself down before coming back to the table. She didn't know I was interested in paranormal or ghost and thought that I would judge her and call her crazy. A minute later, the waitress came to our table to refill our drink. She noticed that my date was a mess and asked if everything was okay. My date looked at the waitress and said, you won't believe me if I told you, but something just happened to me in the restroom. I think a ghost was messing with me. She had told the waitress the whole story just to have the waitress reply, yeah, you're not the first one to have that happen to them. The ghost liked to hang out in the woman's restroom for some reason. I don't think that that date made her feel any better. <laughs> <laughs> Another time, I was sitting at a dining table having dinner with one of my friends. All of a sudden, she jumps and her face turns white almost instantly. All of the blood drained from her skin. I asked her what was wrong. She told me something has grabbed my leg twice. The first time I thought it was you. But this time both hands are where I can see them. I asked her what she meant. She grabbed or and something had grabbed her leg. She said it felt like something had gripped her thigh and squeezed. She could feel a hand squeezing her leg. Oh, no. While wow. she had refused to ever go back to the Moon River Brewing Company since. <laughs> you ready to go? <laughs> I'm, I'm still going to go. Yeah, I'm done. Awesome. Because you're going. <laughs> the next account is in relation to the activity on the upper floors of the pub. On the upper floors, all sorts of ghostly and shadowy events have been reported. The infamous lady in white. Now, why are all ghosts always dressed in white? You know? But, well, back then, I mean, they did wear a lot of white, I guess. Yeah, so. you know, you're not wrong there. And plus, I think that like all their 90s were almost all in white, yeah. too. Right? People being pushed down the stairs, construction crews being chased out by unforeseen forces. It has all happened on the upper floor of the Moon River Brewing Company. According to many sources, the fourth floor of the Moon River Brewing Company seems to harbor dark energy. It is known that during many yellow fever outbreaks in Savannah, that part of the building, including the top floor, was used as a makeshift hospital. Of course, there were many deaths in the building from people who lost the battle with the horrible disease. It killed without mercy. Is there energy that people feel on this floor? Are they the ghosts of the people that people see that they experience up there as a result of the death and suffering that occurred when the building was used as a hospital? It's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. The Moon River Brewing Company and all the ghosts can be found at 21 West Bay Street. In addition to the ghosts, the Moon River also serves up some fantastic brews and food. Come take a bite at the pub. Just don't let the ghosts of the pub bite you. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, what are your thoughts? That's a great story. I love that. And I'm really excited to go there for maybe some ghosty activity. I definitely like brews. Mm -hmm. And I like bites to eat. So, <laughs> And hopefully you don't like to get bit by ghosts. No. But, well, no. I, I definitely they, don't want that. You know, That's the world. We'll save that for, for, for Dylan. For dessert? <laughs> <laughs> well, for Dylan. I remember he got bit. Like, he got bit. He, he did. That one time. That's yeah. true. <laughs> Toby, don't be biting people. All right. Well, my show sources for my story on Oba Chandler was an article by TalkMurderWithMe.com, a Wikipedia article on Oba Chandler, as well as I listened to a podcast episode. Um, the podcast was called True Crime All the Time, and it was obviously about Oba Chandler. And I think I found a new podcast, by the way, because I actually really liked the... It was two guys, and I liked the the way that they... Okay. Did things. All right. So, I'm done anyway, for new, yeah. new great podcast. I uh, <laughs> love that. Hate him. My sources on the Moon River Brewing Company are the Moon River Brewing Company's website on the Ghost Travel Channel's article on the Ghost Adventures, Nightly Spirits article on the restaurant, beerinfo.com's article, and then I have three Wikipedia articles on the Moon River Brewing Company, Eliezer Early, and the Minnis Stark Duel. All right. Yeah. So this was a great episode. We're coming to an end of season two here in the next couple weeks. We're going to be taking a month off in July so we can go explore Savannah, celebrate some birthdays, yes. and, you know, live a little bit of life. But don't worry. We're still here for you for another couple weeks. And just as a reminder, Renee, what is that thing you say, like, at the end of every episode? Are you talking about the whole, like, mystery never sleeps? Oh, that's the one, and neither do we. Bye, Bye baby! Bye, baby!
Bitch. Humor, haunts, and homicide.